Our scripture reading this morning comes from the book of 1 Peter, chapter 2, starting at verse 13. Be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it be the emperor as supreme or to governors as sent by him to punish those who do evil and to praise those who do good. For this is the will of God that by doing good, you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. Live as people who are free, not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but living as servants of God. Honor everyone, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the emperor. Servants, be subject to your masters with all respect, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the unjust. For this is a gracious thing when, mindful of God, one endures sorrows while suffering unjustly. For what credit is it if when you sin and are beaten for it, you endure? But if when you do good and suffer for it, you endure, this is a gracious thing in the sight of God. For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. For by his wounds you have been healed. For you were straying like sheep, but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. The Lord's our rock, in Him we hide, a shelter in the time of storm. Secure whatever ill betide, a shelter in the time of storm. Oh, Jesus is a rock in a weary land, a weary land. A weary land, oh Jesus is a rock in a weary land, a shelter in the time of storm, a shade by day, defense by night, a shelter in the time of storm, no fears alarm, no foes affright, a shelter in the time of storm, oh Jesus is a rock in a weary land, a weary land. A weary land, oh Jesus is a rock in a weary land, a shelter in the time of storm. The raging storms may round us beat, a shelter in the time of storm. We'll never leave our safe retreat, a shelter in the time of storm. Oh Jesus is a rock in a weary land, a weary land. A weary land, oh Jesus is a rock in a weary land, a shelter in the time of storm. Oh rock divine, oh refuge dear, a shelter in the time of storm. Be thou our helper ever near, a shelter in the time of storm. Oh Jesus is a rock in a weary land, a weary land. A weary land, oh Jesus is a rock in a weary land. A shelter in the time of storm. Last week I mentioned that we can have patience with people and we can have patience with circumstances and that the Bible has something to say about both of these things. Last week we talked about having patience with people. So this week, we will talk about having patience with circumstances. Obviously, the years 2020 and 2021 have seen a lot of challenging circumstances for many of us. And some guidance in dealing with circumstances beyond our control can be very helpful. When we consider having patience with circumstances, there are a lot of examples in Scripture that we could talk about. One that comes to mind quickly is James chapter 5, verse 11, which tells us that Job had patient endurance. 
Now, when you read the book of Job, it doesn't always seem like he had patient endurance. He seems angry, discouraged, and at times frustrated with God. Patience in this circumstance does not mean bearing difficult circumstances in silence. It means not quitting, not giving up. Job's patience can be summarized in his rebuke to his wife, who suggested that he should just curse God and die. Job refused to allow his circumstances to define the sort of man he was. We see the same sort of thing with King David throughout the Psalms. When he was downhearted, when he was in troubling and challenging circumstances, he didn't remain quiet. He called out to God for deliverance, and sometimes he called out in what we would describe as a complaining tone of voice. Yet in all of it, his circumstances didn't cause him to violate the character God was building in his life. Now here's another important lesson to be learned from the story of Job. Job and his friends spend most of the book arguing about why bad things happen to good people. But at the end of the book, God basically asks Job, Who are you to question me and think you can understand me? And Job has to answer in chapter 40, verses 4 and 5, Behold, I am of small account. What shall I answer you? I lay my hand on my mouth. I have spoken once, and I will not answer twice, but I will proceed no further. Job acknowledges his own inability to comprehend God's ways. I think it's important to note that in the entire book of Job, we see no indication that Job ever finds out the reason for his circumstances. We would do well to take a lesson from Job in this. We live in a society that thinks that every question can be answered and should be answered. When difficult circumstances come our way, we feel like we need to understand why they are happening. God allowed this to happen to me because he wants to teach me a lesson, and I just need to figure out what that lesson is. Or, God sent this circumstance because of some hidden sin in my life. I wish I knew what it was. Now, there are a couple dangers we need to be aware of when we start thinking in these ways. First, we make the assumption that we are capable of understanding what an infinite God, whose ways are far above ours, is doing. It is unwise for me to assume that when some difficult circumstance comes my way, that God has exactly one reason for allowing it. It would also be egocentric for me to assume that God's reasons must be specifically centered around me. The second danger is that we start to think that God cannot work in our lives unless we know what he is doing. And that simply is not true. When I'm guiding my children, I do not necessarily say to them, Now I'm going to teach you a lesson in mercy or I am going to teach you a lesson in generosity. Instead, I simply guide them through the circumstance they are dealing with. When it's all said and done, they probably won't think to themselves, Daddy just taught me a lesson about mercy, or Daddy just taught me a lesson about generosity. While it's happening, they probably don't even realize that they're internalizing a lesson in Christian character. Now, sometimes, when I sit down with my children at bedtime and read a Bible verse with them, when we're trying to discuss and understand what it means, one of them will say, oh, that's like that time. And I'll realize they internalized it, and they didn't know they were doing it. And if my children can do that, don't you think God can do that with you? Can God, through your circumstances, mold your character without you even realizing what he's doing? He certainly can. And you know that it often works that way because you've had circumstances in your life that caused you to change and to grow, and it was only much later that you saw how those circumstances changed you. Like Job, we must learn the lesson that we can patiently endure 
without having to know reasons. A childlike trust in God is sufficient. So what do we do with circumstances God has given us? How do we endure them patiently? I'd like to take a look at the Israelites who were sent into captivity in Babylon because of their generations-long reign of lawlessness and idolatry. So consider these words from Jeremiah chapter 29, starting at verse 1. These are the words of the letter that Jeremiah the prophet sent from Jerusalem to the surviving elders of the exiles and to the priests, the prophets, and all the people whom Nebuchadnezzar had taken into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. This was after King Jeconiah and the queen mother, the eunuchs, the officials of Judah and Jerusalem, the craftsmen and the metal workers had departed from Jerusalem. The letter was sent by the hand of Elasa the son of Shaphan and Jemariah the son of Hilkiah, whom King Zebediah of Judah sent to Babylon, to Nebuchadnezzar king of Babylon. It said, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all the exiles whom I have sent into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Build houses and live in them. Plant gardens and eat their produce. Take wives and have sons and daughters. Take wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage that they may bear sons and daughters. Multiply there and do not decrease. But seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile and pray to the Lord on its behalf. For in its welfare, you will find your welfare. For thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, do not let your prophets and your diviners who are among you deceive you, and do not listen to the dreams that they dream. For it is a lie that they are prophesying to you in my name. I did not send them, declares the Lord. For thus says the Lord, when seventy years are completed for Babylon, I will visit you, and I will fulfill to you my promise and bring you back to this place. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me, and I will hear you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord, and I will restore your fortunes and gather you from all the nations and all the places where I have driven you declares the Lord, and I will bring you back to the place from which I sent you into exile. So let's break this down a little bit. The people of Israel had been dragged into exile and captivity in Babylon, and many false prophets had arisen and were telling the people, don't worry, God is going to rescue you from this captivity any day now. You're going to be back in Israel before you know it. But the prophet Jeremiah, the true prophet, had a quite different message. His message was, no, you're not going back to Israel anytime soon. In fact, most of you will die in captivity. But in 70 years, God will take your children and your grandchildren back to their homeland because he still has good plans for the nation. Jeremiah's message probably was not eagerly received by people who wanted to believe their circumstances were going to be short-lived. What was Jeremiah's advice for the people? How were they to patiently endure 70 years of exile? The advice is in the verses we just read in verses 4 through 7. In summary, God tells the people, settle in, build houses, plant gardens, do your jobs, raise your children, let them marry and begin lives of their own, and in everything, treat the society you are in as your own, and do what is best for that society. For in that society's welfare, you will find your own welfare. You see, if the Israelites had listened to the false prophets who promised a speedy end to their captivity, they would have done none of those things. They would have done nothing more than simply wait. But God didn't create us to simply wait for our circumstances to end. He created us to be active no matter what our circumstances. 
One of my favorite verses in Ephesians is Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, which tells us that we were created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God created beforehand for us. In other words, God's plan has never been for us to simply do nothing while we wait for our circumstances to change. Patient endurance means looking at the circumstances we are in and instead of just waiting for them to end, continually asking ourselves, what can I do with these circumstances? In addition to this, it's important for us to understand that God has not made a guarantee that our circumstances will ever change in this life. Indeed, because we are mortal, we all have the stark reality of eventually coming face to face with a circumstance from which we do not find release in this life. We have a tendency to misread verses like Jeremiah 29 11, which says that God has good plans for us to give us future and a hope. And we tend to misread verses like Romans 8 28, which tells us all things work together for good. We read Jeremiah 29 11 as a personal promise to each of us individually, rather than what it was, a promise to a group of people, a future generation, rather than the present generation which would mostly die in captivity. Similarly, we read Romans 8.28 as a guarantee that whatever circumstance we face in this life will come to our good in this life, while ignoring that both before and after that verse, the passage is talking about our future glorification. Certainly, all things work together for good, and some of that good may come in this life. But it may wait for the next one. We must also recognize that sometimes our difficult circumstances may work for the future, the hope, and the good of someone else. That's the example of Jeremiah chapter 29, but it's also the example of Christ, who suffered the agony of the cross in this life for the sake of our good. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross. And that's what Paul meant when he talked about joining in the fellowship of Christ's suffering. We who follow in Christ's footsteps can rejoice through suffering, knowing that we are joining in fellowship with him. If my suffering in this life will result in the eternal good for another soul, I will rejoice even while I weep over my suffering. Now, does that mean that we suffer in silence and don't hope for an end to difficult circumstances? No, it doesn't. In 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 20, Paul is talking about freedmen and bondservants, and he tells bondservants that if they can gain their freedom, they should do so but they should not be concerned about it. In other words, while reaching the end of a difficult circumstance is desirable, living well within those difficult circumstances is even better. How do we patiently endure the circumstances we are in? Well, we welcome the end of those circumstances if and when it comes, but in the meantime, we live life as fully as we can in the midst of our circumstances with grace and godliness. Do your work. Care for your family. Seek the welfare of the land where you dwell. And sometimes our circumstances make us feel small and insignificant. So I invite you to consider these words from Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. If I cannot do great things, I can do small things in a great way. Keep confidence 
that even the small things you do will be made great by the power of God and therefore never quit. Galatians 6, 9, which we'll look at another day, has this to add. And let us not grow weary of doing good, for in due season we shall reap if we do not give up. So don't give up. One last thought. It's tempting to say, I don't have enough patience for this trial I'm going through. And you know what? Maybe you're right. Maybe you don't have enough patience. But here's what James says in chapter 1, verses 2 through 4 of the book of James. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness, and let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. You may not have patience enough for the trial you face, but take courage and hope in this. The trial you face is building patient endurance in you and that patient endurance will make you complete let's pray lord god we acknowledge that we struggle daily in this world of pain and suffering there are circumstances that all of us face together but also each of us face our own private struggles and pains and they are hard to bear with patience Help us to live life fully and abundantly within the circumstances you've given us and build in us the patience that comes from facing trials with hope. And Lord, as you use our circumstances for our good or for the good of those around us, help us live in the hope of your good work and in the hope of the joy that lies before us. We pray in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.